the art of fighting without fighting? Show me some of it. Hi there everybody, Michael Valenti here with the School of Self-Defense in Indianapolis and today I'm going to be reacting to the rules of Sambo. One of my most popular videos is a tier list in which I rank various martial arts on how well they prepare you for self-defense. Every single day when I log in to check on the comments on my channel, I am flooded with requests for my thoughts on Sambo. And Sambo wasn't included into the list mostly because I'm not all that familiar with the art. One thing I want to make very clear is that I'm coming at this from the standpoint of a self-defense instructor. So please keep that in mind that I'm not going to be looking at this from the lens of someone preparing for mixed martial arts or for somebody who wants to win a street fight. I'm primarily going to be focusing on how well this rule set could potentially prepare you to deal with unwanted violence being forced upon you. And according to the YouTube algorithm gods, I've already put too large of an intro on this and half the people lost their interest. So let's go ahead and just get right into looking at the rules. So uh, for those of you guys who don't know, this is the uh, Sambo FIA S channel that I'm looking at here. And it's entirely in Russian or some other language that I don't speak. Um, so we have mostly these subtitles as a way of looking at it. And as he already mentioned there, the Sambo is kind of a mixture of wrestling and judo. Now that's very interesting. Here it's sa he's saying that there's actually three different brands of Sambo, which is kind of interesting. So I've only actually known about two. So he's saying that there is Sambo the sport, which is the rules that we're looking at. Then there's combat Sambo, which I'm vaguely familiar with. It looks a lot like MMA. Um, and then there's also Sambo as a system of self-defense. So already, that's pretty cool that this is a study that you can get a, a lot of different knowledge from. But once again, this video is going to be just about the rules of the sport and how they can affect your self-defense training. So let's keep it going. Um, so let's see. There's three main ways for the competitors to score and win in a fight. So they can do throws, they can do hold downs, and they can do painful holds, which are submissions. Looks like there's a lot of wrestling in these takedowns. It's very wrestling-oriented takedowns, a lot of attacking the legs. Oh, I love this. So here he says, the key is keeping a clear head in an unfavorable situation. Boy, I love that so much. So one of the most frustrating aspects of teaching self-defense and then being in the self-defense world is there's so many self-defense schools that teach this constant mantra, this constant thing that when you are attacked, you are going to be so flooded with fear and, um, and you know, adrenaline that you're going to be incapable of doing any kind of high level martial arts and the thing he's saying here where he says the key is to keep a clear head in unfavorable situations is exactly kind of my school's take on self-defense a hundred percent if you were attacked randomly on the street by somebody there is a very high likelihood that you will panic that you will freak out and your fine motor skills will go to shit and your brain will be going like crazy and you're going to get tunnel vision if you were trained incorrectly. At the higher level of self-defense, we wanna train ourselves to delay, if not completely eliminate, the stress response when we encounter violence. That way, just like how this guy is saying, that you wanna keep a clear head in unfavorable situations. You will always fight better if you don't panic, and if you are panicking, it is because you are not well trained. So keep that in mind. Let's keep this going. So a throw to the side scores two points if the attacker ends up on the ground and four points if he manages to remain standing. Oh boy, I do love that rule. Whereas I'm not familiar with Sambo, I am very familiar with Judo. I've been doing Judo for years. It's one of my favorite martial arts and I steal a lot of Judo in our self-defense program. But one of my general gripes with Judo is the fact that there is effectively no difference in the sport if I throw you and stay standing versus I throw you and I fall with you. As long as the throw contains all of the essential elements for an epon, which is like a victorious point, if I go down with you, it's all good in judo. 
but in self-defense, it's always better to stay standing. And this rule here, where you effectively get double the points for doing a takedown and staying standing, is encouraging that good behavior to try to stay upright even when you take your opponent down. From a self-defense standpoint, that rule gets a huge thumbs up. Boy, I wish they just included that rule in judo. I think that would really make the game more interesting. So let's continue to look at more of these rules. One final scenario is the throw that most often seen in competition when the opponent is thrown onto their chest, buttocks, or shoulders. The attacker scores one point if he ends up on the ground and two points if he stays standing. The fight ends as soon as there is an eight point difference between the players. Okay, cool. So the point system doesn't really matter that much as far as self-defense is concerned. But the biggest thing I saw when it comes to this takedown is that the it seems like the best thing that you can do in Sambo is to throw someone onto their shoulders, onto their back, and remain standing. And like the lowest point you're going to get from your takedowns is if you go down with your opponent and they land on their belly. At least that seems to be what the rules are here. And for the most part, I think those are actually really good rules rules to help enforce good habits in self-defense absolutely when you take someone to the ground there's a strong likelihood that you may fall with them but if you can stay standing that is ideal it's a little bit more of a gray area about what is the best way to throw somebody on their back on their shoulder on their stomach the benefit of throwing somebody onto the back is that they're going to have the wind knocked out of them and it also puts you in a phenomenal position to do a lot of controlling pins like a knee on chest or a side control also people tend to get up by rolling to their belly and kind of pushing up so by landing someone on their back it gives that extra step that they have to go through if they want to get up landing someone on their shoulder on the other hand can be extremely devastating if you're throwing somebody on hard ground lots of times kind of tucking your throw in towards yourself in a way that makes all of their weight go directly onto their shoulders can be extremely devastating and of course landing someone on their belly whereas that does allow them to get up quickly it does give you quick access to their back and from back control you have a lot of access to the most important tools in grappling chokes so because I have more of that judo background, I tend to have all my throws kind of landing people on their backs at my feet, but I don't necessarily think it's a terrible thing if you land someone on their shoulder or on their belly. So let's keep on keeping on. The second possibility is hold downs. We call these pins. The attacker forces the opponent to lie down with his back to the mat and presses against him torso to torso. The hold must last at least 10 seconds to score a point. That's really good. And the longer the hold, the more points are awarded. With a maximum limit of 4 points. Which would be a 20 second hold. I love any grappling art that puts a lot of focus on holds and pin down. Because not all self-defense situations are life or death. So a scenario I use a lot on this channel would be if a father discovers his 16 year old or 17 year old son is doing drugs. He goes to confront his son about it. His son swings on him and having the ability to pin and hold and control someone without hurting them is a phenomenally valuable skill in such a situation. The ultimate technique to defeat your opponent is a painful hold. It allows you to win before the end of a 5 minute time limit. The opponent's arms or legs are locked, causing hyperextension of the joints or compression of muscles. If the opponent can no longer bear the pain, he signals with his hand that he gives up. This automatically hands the victory to the attacker, and the fight is stopped. Total victory. I love that term, total victory. So submissions, or painful holds, as they're calling it in this video, are an extremely important skill to develop, once again, when it comes to self-defense. But I don't know if they are allowing chokes in this sport. And that could be a big issue, so let's take a look at that and see if Sambo allows chokes. Are chokes legal in Sambo? Let's see. Okay, here we go. Also, in sports Sambo, only arm locks and straight leg locks are legal. No chokes, twisting leg locks like heel hooks or neck cranks are allowed. Okay, 
So that's a big thumbs down for Sambo. Now, of course, right now I'm only looking at the sport of Sambo and how those rules are training you for self-defense. And it could be different in combat Sambo, and I really hope it's different in the self-defense Sambo. Chokes are effectively the checkmate of grappling. Any art that stems from jujitsu is going to have something like a reclining armbar. And these attacks are incredibly effective and useful in the world of self-defense, but a common misunderstanding is that they are not always fight enders. Just because someone taps out in the gym or in a tournament doesn't actually mean that it would end a fight in real life. I think most people have experienced in high school that kid who like broke a rib or shattered his wrist while playing football or something and then secretly didn't tell anybody and finished out the game because he was that determined to win. Another example of that is Kurt Angle. Look him up and read about how with a broken neck he finished a wrestling tournament. That kind of determination exists outside of just sports. Whereas broken bones and dislocated joints are going to increase your chance of victory, chokes are going to render your opponent unconscious. It doesn't matter how big of a badass he is and how strong his will to win is if my opponent is asleep. Let's keep on going. Sambo is a complete and technical sport combining strength, agility, and endurance. I hope this explanation helps you to better understand the sport of Sambo. Yeah, I think that did a great job. Obviously right now I'm just looking at the rules, but the rules oftentimes shape the art. So for example, judo has double legs and single legs and ankle picks. Judo even has things like ankle locks and knee bars. It's just people don't really practice them that often in judo because of the rules of the sport. And the rules of the sport are going to dictate how you fight. So what are the pros of this rule set that are really increasing your self-defense abilities by studying Sambo. The first and most important is that combination of judo and wrestling. A lot of times there's kind of a debate in the grappling world about like which is better, judo, jujitsu, wrestling, and it looks like Sambo kind of takes all of that into one place so that you aren't really looking at the world of grappling through such a narrow lens. Another benefit that I haven't mentioned yet is the fact that they fight with a jacket, with a gi. When I first started studying Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I was a no gi die hard because no one wears a gi in the street, is at least what I thought. But as I got deeper into the self defense world, I realized how silly and kind of dude bro y that statement actually is. You know, the argument is always no one walks around in a gi. Well, yeah, they do. They wear jackets, they wear suit coats, they wear clothes. <laughs> in my experience, nobody walks around in rash guards. And because of that, I found the gi is actually more street than no gi. And the final really, really big plus, this is probably the biggest plus in this rule set, is this rule that you get extra points if you stay standing. So what are the downsides that I'm seeing from this rule set? Well, first and foremost, as I've already mentioned, is a lack of choking. I think if you aren't thinking about chokes, if you aren't being choked, and if you aren't actively trying to get chokes, you're really messing up, at least as far as self-defense is concerned. Another inherent weakness of any sport is going to be the weight class-based techniques. I am fully aware that if you are training at a gym, you are fighting people of a lot of different sizes. But if you've ever trained like a 120 pound woman, and had her practice techniques on like a 200 or 250 pound man, you learn really quickly that there are certain techniques that don't really work if the size discrepancy is too large. Like a really wild story of this is I one time watched a girl grappling this larger dude and she successfully got him in an arm bar and then he just curled her up. She literally, her entire body wasn't strong enough to resist his ability to like curl her up with from that armbar position. But later on in the match, she was able to put him in a rear naked choke and he had to tap out, otherwise he would have passed out. That shows you that if you've never really dealt with those kind of size discrepancies or taught people who are extremely small, sometimes you miss sight of that. So kind of off the cuff downsides of this rule set is that the no chokes is probably the biggest one and by the very nature of the art, just kind of watching some of these clips, there was quite a few kind of size dependent techniques that may muddy the waters about what is actually effective versus a much larger opponent. If you would be interested in me looking at more of the combat Sambo or the self-defense Sambo, let me know down in the comment section below. A lot of very angry people will comment on my videos having not watched the entire thing. 
So if you made it to the end of this video, include the word jacket in your comments so that you and I both know that you made it to the end. And of course, if you are sitting here at the end of this video, you're clearly enjoying this content. So please be sure to hit the thumbs up, click the subscribe button and ring the bell so you can get notified whenever I release new content. And for those of you who live in the Indianapolis area, all the information you need to get started is on our website, theschoolofselfdefense.com. And if you live too far away to train with me in person, we do offer online Zoom classes once a week on Wednesdays, so you can sign up for those once again at our website, theschoolofselfdefense.com. So until next time, everybody, I'm Michael Valenti with the School of Self-Defense. Fight on.